Stories and Documentary Network. The Greek philosopher Plato once expounded upon an advanced civilization, as narrated by the Egyptian priests in the latter epoch of the dynasties. According to Plato's account, this civilization had traversed the oceans millennia ago, only to encounter devastation through a cataclysmic flood. The concept of a great flood is not confined to Plato's narrative. It finds mention in various sources, including sacred texts such as the Torah and the Quran, as well as the Avesta and Zoroastrianism, ancient Indian scriptures, and Sumerian inscriptions in Mesopotamia. Myriad cultures across diverse civilizations harbor myths and legends depicting a global catastrophe that nearly obliterated humanity before the advent of recorded history. Nevertheless, this notion is contentious and meets resistance from secular scholars and numerous scientists. Even among those willing to entertain the possibility, some restrict the flood's impact to a more confined region, such as the ancient Mesopotamian lands. The central question endures. Did a global flood truly transpire, or was it a localized event, or perhaps it did not occur at all? Addressing this query assumes paramount importance in comprehending the origins of civilizations and unraveling authentic historical timelines. In embarking upon this investigation without resorting to speculation, I shall present documented facts and incorporate insights from scholars spanning various disciplines, including archaeology, geology, natural history, astronomy, and geography. When referencing an advanced civilization that once navigated the oceans before succumbing to a great flood, I intentionally eschew the term Atlantis. This deliberate choice stems from the fact that the mere mention of Atlantis has become a source of trepidation for many, especially within scientific circles. The term triggers skepticism, causing some individuals to disengage. This skepticism arises primarily due to the absence of tangible evidence supporting the existence of such a civilization, apart from the accounts conveyed by Egyptian priests to Plato and Herodotus during their dialogues. Numerous global heritage narratives offer descriptions aligning with what Plato recounted about the lost civilization. However, they refrain from explicitly identifying it as Atlantis. Instead, they provide intricate details mirroring Plato's descriptions without specifying the name Atlantis. For a comprehensive exploration of the ancient Egyptian timeline, we can delve into the meticulously delineated history by the Egyptian priest Manetho of Sabenidos, who categorized it into three prehistoric ages preceding the so-called dynastic era. These ages purportedly extended for approximately 36,000 years, anti-dating the reign of King Narmer and the unification of the Egyptian kingdoms. This constitutes a vital component of the authentic lifespan of the Egyptian civilization, our journey will traverse various civilizations that were presumed not to have been in contact with each other, or at least, as documented in history books. Did the great civilizations only flourish in the Middle East and Near East, excluding the rest of the world? On the other side of the globe, in South America, referred to as the New World, is it truly new, or is it new to us only? In Bolivia, the archaeological site of Tiwanaku presents mysterious craftsmanship and advanced structures that defy explanation. Just over a century ago, archaeologists determined that the city of Tiwanaku in Bolivia functioned as an astronomical observatory, aligning with the sun and stars and measuring stellar positions in correlation with the city's design. Their findings suggested an expected age of up to 17,000 years, using a method akin to Robert Bouval's determination of the age of the Egyptian pyramids. These pieces of evidence were neglected until recently. In this context, archaeologist Dr. Neil Steed states, I believe the true history of Tiwanaku extends beyond 12,000 years, making it one of the oldest cities on Earth. The precision of the rock facades at this site is remarkable. If we were to bring a needle and attempt to insert it into every point where two rocks meet, we would be unable to do so. When the Spanish invaders asked the Inca people about whether they built Tiwanaku, they replied negatively, stating it was constructed long before them. This serves as evidence that an advanced civilization built it, and serendipitous discoveries reveal the remarkable evolution of this great civilization. The stones used in Tiwanaku are not cemented together. When someone separates two rocks, they discover an unexpected metal connecting them in the form of metal clamps. It's iron. 
But iron? How is that possible? Iron was not known until around 1500 BCE in the Middle East and 800 BCE in Europe. Did the peoples of the Americas have knowledge of iron before that? What has been discovered is truly astonishing. It implies the need for a mobile metal smelting facility to keep iron liquid and use it in construction. Our exploration of these interconnected mysteries challenges conventional narratives and prompts us to reconsider the scope and interactions of ancient civilizations across the globe. This implies not only a knowledge of iron but also the possession of technology to melt and maintain iron in a liquid state throughout the construction process, even on the building site itself. This necessitates advanced iron smelting facilities capable of generating temperatures in the thousands of degrees Celsius and requiring substantial energy, something unattainable solely with wood, even with our current technological advancements. Does this suggest they possess technology that remains undiscovered by our modern understanding? Yet, the discovery of iron clamps in Tiwanaku is not the most peculiar aspect. We now shift our gaze to Africa, specifically Egypt, on the other side of the world, where colossal rock structures were formed using the same advanced technology. According to historical records, the ancient Egyptians were a people devoid of knowledge regarding wheels, pulleys, or even cranes. So, the perplexing question arises, how did they manage to construct structures with stones weighing over a hundred tons, reaching great heights? Quoting from Robert Bouval's book, As an engineer, let me tell you that to lift rocks of this size, we need special equipment, colossal machinery. For people who didn't have cranes, didn't know wheels, and used simple copper tools, it is scientifically and theoretically impossible to achieve such a feat. Bouval, along with numerous other scholars, contends that the Great Pyramid of Giza is more than just a tomb. In his book titled, The Guardian of Genesis, which explores various mysterious phenomena and issues, Christopher Dunn, an engineer and an expert in stone cutting within the Great Pyramid, raises an intriguing question, how did the ancient Egyptians, armed with primitive tools, achieve a perfectly polished and leveled interior surface of the stone sarcophagus, matching the precision of the exterior surface? Such an accomplishment demands a sophisticated understanding of physics. Turning our attention to the sacred bull pits in the Serapium, Saqqara, we encounter boxes made of black and red granite. The remarkable elements here include the extraordinary leveling of the granite surfaces and the frightening precision of the right angles. What stands out is not only the leveling and angles of the external surfaces, which are considered impossible, but the level of precision in the smoothness of the internal surfaces and the straightness of the angles inside the box surpasses that of the external surfaces. An example is a box with a polished and leveled interior surface, while the exterior is yet to be worked on. It's crucial to note that these boxes are a single piece cut from a granite block, carved, and not assembled from six-sided components, as one might expect. These enigmatic structures in Egypt, combined with the technological sophistication of Tiwanaku, prompt us to reassess the conventional narratives surrounding ancient civilizations and consider the possibility of shared knowledge or even a global connection that predates our current understanding of history. In the words of Christopher Dunn, I say it clearly, we, as humans, until now, did not possess the technology and capabilities to accomplish such a task. The only way to do it is by using a curved saw and a curved drill. Then, they evolved the tools into a machine using sand or diamond, and the process would take an exceptionally long time. I believe they used powerful tools. If we wanted to do this now, in this era, to carve granite in this manner, we would need to develop a granite drill that bores at a rate of 2 inches every 10,000 revolutions. But they, who were much older than us, worked at a much faster pace. Researchers like Christopher believe in the existence of an advanced machine powered by energy that assisted in the drilling. However, the mere mention of the term mechanical drill might seem like an unacceptable conclusion for us. Nevertheless, there are traces of extremely fast drills, and this remains a mysterious matter that needs an answer. As we pass through all these grandiose artifacts, we encounter those Egyptian flower vases. I don't mean the ceramic flower vases you buy from a potter nowadays, but those made of harder rocks such as marble, basalt, and diorite, harder than granite itself. We might understand how they were shaped from the outside, but the puzzle that no one has attempted to answer until now is how they managed to hollow them from the inside through this small opening at the spout. Modern technology, 
advanced complex machinery, and artificial intelligence, supported by sciences in various fields, including space sciences, have not produced a model like this until now. How did they manage to make thousands of them before the dawn of the dynastic era, more than 12,000 years ago? How did they pave their colossal pyramids with immense precision toward the true north, surpassing the knowledge of contemporary builders with our sciences, aircraft, and satellites? The Great Pyramid looks like a mathematical model of half the Earth's sphere and equals the mathematical ratio pi, the ratio of the circumference to the diameter. This forms the foundation of modern mathematics. To achieve results like those in the Great Pyramid, the slope angle of the pyramid's sides must be set at 52 degrees. Any other slope angle will not achieve the mathematical pi ratio. However, did only the Egyptians know and use this mathematical equation in their structures? The answer, of course, is no. Returning to the New World, this mathematical ratio appears in the angles and slopes of this strangely shaped pyramid in the city of Teotihuacan in Mexico, later named the City of the Gods. This city was once larger than Rome, the capital of the Roman Empire. The mysteries embedded in these ancient structures beg us to reconsider the boundaries of our understanding and prompt us to explore the possibility of shared knowledge or influence between civilizations separated by vast distances. And it was adorned with basins on the sides of the city, filled with water, reflecting the sun's rays on its ground in a breathtakingly beautiful scene. The temples, on the other hand, were on the opposite side of the city and believed to mimic celestial bodies. It seems clear that the place contained a distinct fascination with astronomy. During the vernal and autumnal equinoxes, on March 21st and September 21st, these pyramids cast giant shadows directly at their axes, making them solar clocks for people who excelled in measurement and astronomical precision. It appears as though ancient civilizations shared common sources of knowledge and had a profound understanding of the skies that is yet to be fully unveiled. They expressed great admiration for the sun, stars, and the phenomenon of Earth's axial precession, making the towers appear to move in the celestial dome throughout the night and time. Some argue that ancient Egyptians had less knowledge of astronomy, but the evidence from ancient Egyptian inscriptions shows a significant fascination with the sky and astronomical knowledge. Many astronomers believe that studying astronomy is the key to understanding many of Egypt's pyramids. The Egyptians looked at the constellation of Orion as if it symbolized Osiris, representing the afterlife and the realm beyond. Bovell asserts in this regard, evidence of Osiris is found in everything related to the pyramids of Giza. Some columns inside the pyramid that extend upwards, archaeologists do not consider them more than ventilation holes. However, astronomers think otherwise. For the Egyptians, these were the gates to the underworld, representing the kingdom of Osiris, or Orion, as they called it. The Egyptians believed that Osiris was responsible for the process of reincarnation. On the walls of the temples, the Egyptians wrote the following text, O my lord, guide me to the path of the winds, the path in which Orion resides. Many believe that Osiris had extreme significance for the Egyptian builders, as they constructed their pyramids in perfect alignment with Orion's belt. Initially appearing as a coincidence, Bovell noticed that other nearby pyramid sites, when viewed as a single pyramid group, revealed the complete form of Orion on the ground. Starting from the legend of Osiris, some believe he is an Egyptian deity, which is the ancient Egyptian pronunciation for the name Idris, who is mentioned in the Bible as Enoch, the great-grandfather of the prophet Noah. Meaning he was sent to those who inhabited Egypt in the earliest human era, long before the Great Flood, after several millennia. The intricate connections between celestial observations, ancient myths, and the alignment of monumental structures hinted a profound wisdom that transcends individual cultures and beckons us to explore the shared knowledge of our distant ancestors. This confirms the true age of the Egyptian civilization, as discussed in previous research. Egyptians hold Idris, Enoch, in high esteem, and over time, he has transformed into a legend, as is the case with all myths. He is the one who taught the Egyptians those advanced sciences that we have not reached so far. Sciences such as astronomy, engineering, mathematics, timing, and agricultural seasons. Many of these sciences were lost after the flood of Prophet Noah. 
In Mexico, the Teotihuacan Pyramid serves as a similar counterpart. The myths say that this is the city of the gods, and its mission is to transform humans into celestial beings. Similarly, in Egypt, the myths tell us that the pyramids function to assist in the transmigration of humans into stars. However, there was a problem with the Mexican pyramid when it was discovered in 1906 CE. They found large pieces of the remains of a micaceous covering on the ceiling. Mica is a mineral component with silicate crystals, and we know one function of mica. It is used in electrical insulation. Despite mica not being available in Mexico and having to be brought from a distant location in Brazil, they insisted on using it in building that pyramid. Imagine transporting blocks of mica, each with a volume of 40 cubic meters, from a distance of over 3,000 kilometers. Surely, this was not about decoration but undoubtedly about the chemical and physical properties of mica. The city of Tiwanaku in Bolivia is another civilization that shares the same fascination with the sun and stars. Poznanski, one of the Bolivian archaeology experts, explains his discovery. On the first day of spring, the sun rises directly from the heart of the temple, and this discovery was the beginning of a more important one. Poznanski discovered that they built the temple to be an astronomical observatory, in the form of a large sundial, to determine the alignment of the sun. Now, we can use these astronomical alignments to determine the age of the site. After conducting several engineering and astronomical calculations, he concluded that on the first day of spring, the sun appears exactly in the middle. He discovered that the site is designed so that the sun aligns with the right cornerstone on the first day of winter and the left cornerstone on the first day of summer, respectively. However, this did not happen. The experts attributed this discrepancy to a simple reason. The ancients made errors in their astronomical calculations. This acknowledgement prompts us to consider the limitations of our understanding and to appreciate the complexities that ancient civilizations faced in their pursuit of celestial knowledge and architectural precision. But researchers and scientists had a different opinion. After thoroughly studying the temple, its stones and angles, weighing hundreds of tons, and witnessing the astonishing precision in all its aspects, the mere possibility of an error in astronomical calculations was deemed entirely unacceptable. They recalculated Poznanski's calculations, which attributed the site to being an astronomical observatory. Poznanski indicated that the site is over 17,000 years old, based on the measurement of cornerstones and comparing them to the current solar alignment. At that time, the axial tilt of the Earth was not similar to what it is now. The Sun aligned with the angles every summer and winter at that time. They found that Poznanski's calculations were very accurate, and the age of the site according to these calculations ranges from 12,000 to 17,000 years. Did an advanced ancient civilization dominate the world, leaving its traces in various places worldwide? The Egyptian priests told the philosopher Plato that a sophisticated civilization existed more than 12,000 years ago. However, according to science, humans emerged from the Ice Age only 5,000 years ago. Could the ancients have made this astonishing civilizational leap preceding the Stone Age? In Egypt, the Sphinx statue presents strange and inexplicable scenes. Investigator John West conducted research that proved the Sphinx did not undergo the same natural factors as its surroundings. The environment around it was affected by horizontal wind and sand erosion, while it was affected by circular sculpting and undulating weathering marks. The West states that one doesn't need to specialize in earth sciences to realize the difference in erosion. Only water falling from above is capable of causing such undulations and cracks in solid walls. Wind and sand cause erosion in horizontal lines. Rainfall must have occurred continuously for several thousand years, at a substantial rate, to make this possible. Of course, there was no heavy rainfall in the Egyptian desert during the time of the pharaohs, as the region was extremely arid. For this to be possible, we must go back to the period after the last ice age, starting around 10,500 years before the Common Era, well before the emergence of the Pharaonic dynasties by thousands of years. This period is known as the Wet or Flood Age, which submerged Egypt, North Africa, and many fertile lands, lasting for thousands of years. Egyptian archaeologists scoffed at this theory, but geological scientists adhered to it, proving their theory scientifically. 
The implications of these findings force us to reconsider the timeline of human history and the existence of advanced civilizations that may have flourished far earlier than conventional wisdom suggests. And here, Bovel states, according to astronomical measurements, all the Egyptian pyramids, including those at Giza, date back to this time period mentioned in the theory of the Sphinx. The design of the Giza pyramid complex, with its pyramids, perfectly matches the Orion constellation in size and direction. Only if we go back to the same mentioned date, which is 10,500 BCE. Returning to this same period, the Sphinx statue would be facing its celestial counterpart in the sky, referring to the Leo constellation. Since that time and onwards, the Orion constellation has begun to move in the celestial sphere, changing the shape of the sky dome with the Earth's axial shift. This could be an intentional signal, marking the beginning of a new era. Was the rise of the Orion constellation, or Osiris, what the ancient Egyptians meant by the ascension of Enoch or Idris to the heavens? If this theory is correct, then Idris ascended to the heavens, after which, many generations later, his great-grandson Noah came after a thousand years of Noah's mission, bringing the great flood that wiped out the advanced ancient civilizations. Afterward, humanity began anew. The new beginning for humanity is now referred to as the Stone Ages. But is there mention of such events in the rest of the world's civilizations? In Bolivia, in the city of Tiwanaku, myths venerate a lord known as Viracocha. According to the legend, Viracocha is tall, bearded, and fair-skinned. He appeared during a time of chaos and destruction, emerging from beyond the seas and bringing hope, knowledge, and stability to humankind. In Mexico, myths speak of their reverence for a lord known as Quetzalcoatl, Symbols of Quetzalcoatl are found in every temple and place, represented by the winged serpent. Mexican myths also state that he is fair-skinned, tall, and bearded. He came from beyond the seas, from the east, after massive floods, giving people the seeds of knowledge and civilization on this side of the world. Were these sacred lords real individuals who appeared after devastating disasters that befell the world, destroying civilizations? Was there an advanced civilization before this catastrophe, perhaps not only confined to knowledge and sciences but spreading its wisdom and sciences to different corners of the world, such as Egypt, Iraq, Mexico, China, and other lands? If we take clues from each civilization, analyzing each reveals only a little. However, what if we gather the commonalities of all civilizations and put them together? The threads of shared myths and legends woven across diverse cultures beckon us to explore the possibility of a global connection and an advanced civilization that once shared its wisdom with humanity, leaving traces in the myths and monuments scattered across the continents. For example, the ancient Egyptian civilization and the civilizations of South America on the other side of the world shared massive pyramid structures meticulously aligned with the original directions of the planet, perfectly matching modern mathematical standards. Both sides demonstrated advanced and intricate knowledge of astronomy, evident in the artifacts they left behind. Without the use of gears or mechanical levers, they managed to construct towering structures with colossal stones intricately connected using metal clamps and angles. Both sides employed rituals for mummification to honor and preserve their deceased. German pathologist Irina Balabanova discovered that many Egyptian mummies contained significant proportions of cocaine and nicotine. Despite facing significant scientific criticism for her findings, Irina found the same substances in hundreds of Egyptian mummies. These plants are only found in South America, according to the official narrative, and they were not known anywhere else on Earth before Columbus discovered the Americas. Could the ancient Egyptian civilization have had connections with American civilizations before recorded history? Was Columbus the first explorer of the New World, or was he the last? On the other side of American civilization, the Maya priests possessed tables that allowed them to predict solar and lunar eclipses. Ironically, they did not invent wheels, lacked knowledge of scales, and struggled to organize agriculture to feed their people, contributing to the weakness and collapse of their civilization. Does this make sense? It seems they inherited a portion of knowledge from a more advanced civilization, lost the rest of the sciences, and retained complex astronomical knowledge while lacking in other areas. In the next part, we will explore the remaining scientific evidence for the Flood, 
whether it was regional or global, and the extent to which ancient civilizations were interconnected and in contact with each other. If you enjoyed the content of this video, please subscribe to the channel. Until next time, the examination of these shared practices and artifacts invites us to reconsider the conventional narrative of isolated civilizations and sparks curiosity about the possibility of a shared ancient wisdom that transcended geographical boundaries.